here we go. So thank you everyone for coming. It's so good to see your faces. I miss you, even though it's been like two weeks. Um, I know with Mother's Day, it was kind of weird. I was like, oh, I don't have a book study this week. Um, anyways, I want to say thank you so much to Dee, who is moderating for us today. And let me give you a little bit of a bio on Dee. She uh, grew up in the small town of Anadarko, I think it is, Oklahoma, Anadarko, uh, where and when it wasn't unusual to have the back door unlocked or sit on the front porch just to get some relief from a sweltering Oklahoma day. When she wasn't playing girls basketball and running track, she was active in the United Methodist Church where her parents were youth group leaders. As a young adult, Dee discovered talent for singing and fronted various bands singing cover tunes and writing original songs along the way. That's pretty cool. Her songwriting uh, <laughs> revealed a passion for story writing and eventually led to her first book, Fireside, the James Johnson story, which is debuting this summer, which I think we're targeting uh, June 24th. The setting for Fireside and the flavor of its characters rose out of Dee's experiences with her day job, a physical therapist to countless assistant uh, living patients since graduating from the University of Oklahoma in 1985. She found herself um, drawn to their stories. Dee continues to learn from the integrity, perseverance, morality, and humor of her patients while this book is not reflective of any one person or setting, it is an effort to give back and give a voice to those whose history is often overlooked simply because they are older or infirm. To her patients who have taught her about the important things in life, Dee sends a big thank you. Yes. And that is just beautiful. And I'm so excited. Um, I know Stacy, who is here today with us, uh, was part of the editing process. I'm proud to be a part of it as well, um, helping her to publish this book. And um, without further ado, Dee, why don't you take it, take it away? And I think um, it would be great if we could also do a quick little intro of each one of us uh, here tonight. Okay, well, great. Um, so if uh, each one of you wanna say just your name and, and a bit about you, I think that'd be great. Uh, uh, Kathy, do you care to tell us a bit about you? Well, I missed you all. As you know, I went on a uh, trip here uh, Mother's Day weekend that my daughter was retiring from the military. And it was awesome to be there to see that. But I missed you all. I miss our meetings. And I'm glad we're back tonight. Was it Alabama, Kathy, that you went to? Remind us. Yeah. Yes, it was. Montgomery, Alabama. Super, super. Well, it's good to see you again. It's good to be back. And how about you, Stacy? I'm Stacy Monty, and I have a little Yorkie uh, demanding my attention right now. <laughs> so she might be in some of the frames. <laughs> But I, uh, I'm an editor, freelance editor and writer, and um, also enjoy, you know, playing with my dog, and she's in a lot of my stories. Great, great. Uh, DJ, care to give some, a bit about you? Yes, hi, I'm DJ Mays from Kingfisher, Oklahoma, and I enjoy reading and writing memoir and nonfiction. That's what I like to read and that's what I like to write. And I'm really enjoying being a part of this book club study. I'm going to um, be MIA next week. We're going on vacation to Vicksburg, Mississippi. So mm -hmm. I'm going to read ahead tonight. Even though I won't be here next week, I'll, I'll still be in the loop. Super. Awesome. Leah, did I pronounce that right, Leah? Yes, Lee. Lee, like T, like the C. Got you. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'm I'm Amy's okay. biggest fan. All right. I am cheering for her all the way to the moon. She's the sweetest, and um, 
I, I, I'm sorry, I was uh, rushing my meal so I can be here. So I was still like swallowing and, <laughs> and drinking, but I, I have been um, really tired for the last couple of days. So I'm just going to relax and listen and uh, enjoy the story. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Sarah, how about you? Yay. Thank you for thank you for the time to introduce myself. I am uh, I'm an author also, but I am a, also a fan of Amy. And yes, I follow her and um, I just love her like uh, her energy and her clever <laughs> her clever mind. <laughs> so just uh, I'm just admire her. So I'm here to support. Oh, yeah. so sweet. Great. So see about you guys, not about me. <laughs> <laughs> did I did I get everybody? Did I leave anybody out? No, nope, you got everyone that's on right now. Thank you, G. Okay, great. Well, just a little disclaimer before we get going. Uh, for the study, I think it would be to everybody's uh, benefit that I use the names Snow and Dolly and Duck. And uh, some of the others as we go along, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to mispronounce uh, names, so you might be, have to help me out a little, Amy. But um, I have some questions for all of us. I have a few questions just for Amy because there's some things I'm sure I don't get it and curious about kind of culture type things. And just a few observations, and and uh, I too, I would just like to to mention, um, you know, uh, this book has really opened my eyes. You know, uh, Amy uh, mentioned I'm from small town Oklahoma. What she said was true. I mean, we left the screen door unlocked, and just the mere uh, one of the first times we got together uh, through this stuff, and I read her work. It was just, you know, I just realized this book is going to show me the flip side, like a record, the flip side, um, because I never thought anybody, you know, I called it the Vietnam War, Vietnam War, and, uh, you know, throughout it's the American War, and that gave a whole new light to me. So, um, so anyway, all of that said, let's uh, kick off with uh, chapter 17. A Surrender to Sorrow. Um, in this, uh, the eight-year-old, is it Tuan? Mm -hmm. Tuan? Yep. Um, he gets sick and uh, really terribly sick. Um, and one of the things that I thought was interesting in the beginning was it said uh, the whole family decided to go. He was sick and then it was like not just one or two or I mean, whoever was available, they were all going to go. Um, um, and then the, the way it goes through, you know, they stopped and bought the papaya uh, and the other fruits and uh, the routine stopping at the stoop. Um, um, and a really cool part when a uh, tree remembered and I may be mispronouncing too, Two? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, duck wife, uh, duck, duck's wife. Uh, they remembered uh, buying, you know, trees sold the morphine to her at, at their uh, storefront. Um, and uh, she remembered um, throughout this whole thing, uh, it became very interesting to me, the flow of how a medical visit goes and you know, I'm a physical therapist, so that's kind of my background. But several things in here, it was just like, oh, wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask was, there's probably like about a hundred differences shown in this first chapter, uh, differences between our medical world and, and uh, Snow's medical world. Uh, would anybody toss out something that you recognized in this chapter 17 when that young boy got so sick and they took him what is something that sticks out to you that was like oh wow that's interesting anybody hmm. interesting good question 
Well, let me let me just read. I, I took a few notes and I'm not going to do I won't lead you anywhere, but I'm just going to read a little bit and then it'll be like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Um, uh, so they arrived and tree and two uh, recognized they had a past tree sold the illegal uh, sold the morphine and two took it for her uh, her husband's a doctor. So one of the first things that struck me was duck. Uh, they showed up expecting to see the doctor duck and he was out bicycling and selling bananas. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, whenever he shows up, duck and two exchange affection in front of each other. And then, you know, uh, he, he did a medical workup there, were, there was really no medicine to be given. The medicine was coconut oil and garlic and clean the house well because he had been diagnosed with uh, pinworms and possibly tapeworms. Uh, they, paid, they paid as they left, uh, no, no future bills. They paid as they left, they paid with fruit and Snow gave some money. So compare that to what you would expect when you went to the doctor. How many differences do you see? <laughs> First of all, there's no insurance, right? <laughs> no insurance, no, no denial insurance. either. Nope. Uh -huh. mm -mm. Um, I mean, I will, I will certainly kick it off and say, you know, back then it's pay as you go and whatever you can pay, sometimes you can't pay, you mm -hmm. know, and it's, it's, uh, a good graces kind of visit. Um, but in that scenario, they paid with, I think it was guavas and papayas. Um, yep. And that's very common. Um, I remember when I was little, you know, my mom and I would visit somewhere and we never showed up empty handed. We always brought fruits or vegetables or something um, mm -hmm. because it was considered rude, you know, to show up empty handed. Right. Even if you're not staying for dinner, even if you're just going to, um, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. You, you showed up with something and right. uh, I don't know, that's, that's so different from, from here in America where it's all about the money, show me the money. And uh, can you, right. imagine, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it made me think of um, Dr. Quinn medicine woman. Did you guys ever watch that show? Yes. Right? Yeah. Back then, it's like you just brought whatever in your little basket of <laughs> bread or <Right>. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anybody else think of anything? I mean, that's kind of the obvious, you know, once I read it. But to me, I was just thinking, oh, my gosh. I wonder what uh, my doctor would do if she finished her exam and I said, here, have a few papaya. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, what were some other things that, uh, and just the fact, you know, there is no way a doctor today would be treating in a storefront and he certainly wouldn't be out to make ends meet. He wouldn't be out smelling, selling bananas, you know, that would be totally beneath most doctors. I'm not going to speak for all of them, but that was a real striking in the beginning. It's like the doctor's out selling bananas and given the, given the time of course that makes sense but i was just making a correlation to today i've got a story d that i could share with you uh yeah. i remember my husband told me that his young brother younger brother came down with the exact same thing when he was about three or four mm -hmm. and he was describing it to i said oh yeah that's that's exactly like what's described right here in the story and and this would probably have been like in the early 1960s, which is much earlier than when this takes place of 77. Right. I said, so right. what happened, you know? And, so, and he said, oh, he just prescribed me an oral medication and it cleared up in about three days. And yeah. You know, so right. that's a, a big contrast. If I may inject something. <laughs> Yes, so yes. Growing up in Vietnam, I have a little taste of that. I was there until 16. And oh. um, yes, <laughs> I also have a story. So, but the point is uh, I was there 
and I have watched how my sister was in the hospital, how my mom, my, you know, our family have gone through the system. The thing is, um, there's a couple of times that we have near death experience. Um, and my oh. mom has to go out and buy insulin. Like you have to go find your own pharmacy and bring it into the hospital and give it to the doctor and they will uh, administer it. If the, if the hospital didn't have the hospital didn't have that, then there's nothing they can do. But if you go out and you can find black markets or anywhere, uh, drugs from uh, imported somewhere underground, you bring it in, they will administer it for you. But the thing is, uh, it's all a small country. If you have money, you have um, like private rooms and all this thing. So if you don't, then they will do the very, very, very minimum. Um, gotcha. But I grow up in the city, so I I don't I don't think we ever bring any fruit to the hospitals. But in the countryside, I'm sure there's a lot of that going on. But in the in the city, there yeah, you still have to go find money somehow and pay for it. <laughs> right, right. Wow. Yeah, you, you, you can. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so a lot of people have interestingly pets. because I didn't know that honestly. I didn't know that you had to bring in your own medicine. Well, if you if they if they don't have it, yeah, because yeah. my sister was you know um, many times uh, some of you know my mom has to go out and find thing, and then the pharmacy was closing, and she I mean it's after hours they bang on the door in the pharmacy. It's like I need this. Please open up your door. And you know, in in small country, it's always about bargaining and 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 who do you know? What you get? It's not like a system here, like Walmart closed and that's it. <laughs> but it's a small pharmacy, and you beg and you cry and you bang on the door. And usually, the pharmacists will leave upstairs and their their stores downstairs. So there's a lot of things that you can. I remember that's just is a lot of things that run very very different from the system that we have over here. So there's no government involved. Everything is on your own. And whatever you can find, whatever you can will and deal, that's what you get. And the more people you know, the more connection you have, uh, the more likely that you're able to survive. Wow. Wow. Persistence. It's small country. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, let me flip over here by the way uh, tran is going to be our guest speaker in august uh if you're with the oklahoma city writers inc and yay. he is an incredible speaker and i will say bring tissues or bring karate oh. or maracas i don't know it's like <laughs> you either want to celebrate and say hooray or you want to this cry. is not about me this session is about amy's okay we're gonna, gonna leave it out plug we're gonna me. leave it out we're gonna talk about snow <laughs> but thank you for the plug thank you and uh, i look forward to it and um so it's the focus on you my sis <laughs> the the next question uh is that there's a few that that Amy had shown me earlier, so I think it fits in right here, and I think it's one that we sh shouldn't we should uh, put in up front. The question is uh, in Vietnam, uh, public display of affection is not shown. Parents and siblings rarely hug, kiss, or say "I love you." Husband and wife do not show each other tenderness. However, do you think this this affects the mental health? and how Vietnamese are perceived by foreigners. Why do you suppose they do not show affection? Hmm. I have my well, thoughts, but I think, wait. I think, well, just on the mental health side, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, we, we're all a product of how we grew up. We're all a product, product of how we, what we've lived and what we've seen. And so I would think it would kind of shade uh, how you show affection as you're an adult. And I think it would also shade how you receive it because, uh, I mean, I'm no, uh, this is just uh, simple me thinking, but you know, if, if you're not accustomed to, to that, then uh, maybe, because I tend to be a hugger, you know, in general. So somebody who, who 
uh, maybe hasn't been that uh, introduced to that might see me as extremely overbearing and and that would not be my intention you know so uh, that's one thing i can toss out that i can think of <laughs> You know, I think um, for so long, right, in Vietnam, the, the people are constantly struggling to survive day by day. And uh, I think that's part of the reason why there's no public display of affection because they're focusing on surviving. You know, they don't have time to gotcha. stop and say, I love you and I care about you. Mm -hmm. It's always about the hustling and the surviving. Um, but uh, we're also very private people. We don't share anything out in public, even if it is, you know, good stuff like the affection mm -hmm. piece. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of mental health, I think that's part of the reason why there's so many generations of us who have gone through the war, who are, or who are products of the war, um, you know, we just internalize everything because that's what we're we're told to do. And I think, especially women, girls, you know, we're there to be to be seen but not heard. We're there to keep our heads down and do our job. And so that's that's it, what we know, generation after generation. So yeah, it's. Um, I can imagine there's a lot of depression there because there's no outlet, no one to talk to. And I right. would say that after Lee reading both Lee Tran and Lee Key Tran's memoirs, both of their memoirs, um, it's very evident how, you know, everyone just kind of keeps everything inside because the fear of disappointing their parents, the fear of bringing um, triggering that trauma, you know, you'd rather shield yourself from that by, mm -hmm. by staying um, quiet rather than bringing up something that could result in an outlash. Gotcha. And, and the other part yeah. I think is, um, it's an Eastern culture type of thing. Like they don't express. Um, your parents will get a nod, you know, you will, will, you will get a nod from your parents if they satisfy with it. And you get scolded if, if they're not, but they never tell you, oh yeah, I'm so proud of you. I'm this and I'm that. That's just not of our culture because they didn't want the kids to be arrogant. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be like, you know, giving you plenty of egos and then you're going to grow up like, oh, I know everything. Right. But the thing that also, I also think that is a generational things too. Like I can understand a lot of Americans that it was older generations didn't have the kind of affectionness that from their parents either. It's true. Um, so I have a lot of friends that they craving for the parents' approval and they felt like they their parents never really expressive to them or even tell them that you know they love them. So for me, I backtrack and I say that you know part of it is generational. And I explain to my son also and um, a lot of things that things open up because we advance toward the modern society. We as the generation X and Zs, and they are like, I want to do better. I'm going to put my kids on the pedestal. You know, they're the best. Give them all the confidence that they have. But I think older generation, they don't, I mean, especially from depressions, errors, and uh, mm -hmm. all those times that, you know, you supposed to keep things to yourself. I think that's just my opinion. Yeah, no, I, can, I can see that. It's hard in American society, especially when you see um, you see your American counterparts being attended to and loved and, and you know, hugs and kisses and I love you and all that affection, right? Mm -hmm. um, that in itself is hard to deal with because you're reflecting on your, your own childhood and you're like, my parents never loved and hugged me like that or told me how amazing I am you know, because it's to build resilience, right? But at the same time, it's like, kids need that confidence, that, that assurance, um, but we don't get that. And so it's a, it's a terrible- well, Sometimes they do bad behavior just to attract attention. I know my brothers yeah. did a lot of devious things so he can get that negative affection. Even negative affection is an affection. I mean, not affection, attention. Attention. And Right. I watch in the side light and I shrink and I shrink and I shrink. 
And even my dad passed away 30 some years and I still want to please him. And the, you know, the, the way that I wrote the book, just because that I, I want him to be proud. I know how much he went through. And um, yeah, there's a lot of things that we, we desperately, desperately want to please our parents so much. Um, and I think this very, very common theme is very universal. Um, even though that we think we're alone, <laughs> when we speak out, we all have that same craving. We all have want our parents to approve of us and love us mm -hmm. and tell us that they love us. That's all we want to hear. Yeah. Like, please let me know that you love me. That crosses boundaries, crosses yeah. countries and oceans. You know, it's a, it's a, it's not yeah. just an Asian cultural thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to, um, to, to say that it's not just Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. In Cambodia, I'm, I grew up in Cambodia and it's the same, but I'm not a different, the big difference between Asian culture and the United States is this. In Asian country, we respect, the younger people respect the older people. Mm -hmm. And here, the younger people have more power over the older people. I got a tippy toe around my so, son. Sue, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's totally reversed. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Because uh, they are our gener our, our future, right? Like we, yeah. we need to nurture that. But you're right at the same time. I, know. Filial piety, I feel like, bad. I snap at my mom more than <laughs> Yeah. So it it's just a matter of respect. Yeah. So the, the older people they expect the rest uh, respect from the younger people. So, you know, we are now we, we don't dare to say anything that challenge them and and if they say something more intimate it kind of low down their their status somehow that's that's yeah. i think everybody expect that way it's like the people the older people look at the younger people that oh we are young we don't have enough experience to you know to confront this uh, this um conversation or something like that yeah yeah you know i'll tell you um one more little thing on this there's some some other stuff i want to get to but hearing you guys say that it made me think about myself i was uh raised you know small town uh country folk and uh probably every whipping i got was because i i back talked to my dad and to me, in my mind, I was not back talking. I was trying to explain my point of view. <laughs> and, uh, but to him, if I had a different opinion, uh, then I was back talking. And, it, and uh, it took me forever to figure out. I was like, I don't know. My, my opinion doesn't matter, I guess. I just had a different opinion. At one time, this is a, I laugh about it now, but I was doing my chores and I was cleaning things and, I picked up a stack of mail and I was hustling and I gave the, I just handed the envelopes to my dad. And uh, he said, what do you want me to do with those? And the last time I ever said anything like this, <laughs> I said, I really don't care what you do with them. Well, you know what he did with them? He whooped my butt. And uh, I mean, it sounded terrible because it was all those papers slapping together. And by the time he had about four licks and my sister and my mom, they're rushing in. They're like, what is going on? So uh, there, there is, I'm 60 years old. So I think those of us that are older uh, were, uh, I mean, I, I, I know in the American way what it means that to respect my folks. And, and I kind of learned out the hard way a few times. I never intended it to disrespect, <laughs> but uh, it wasn't received well. <laughs> Not what well, you the say, thing so is, you say it. Well, the it thing is, is, that was exactly it. I was sassy. I did. I sassed him. I got my butt worn out. I probably deserved it. But anyway, <laughs> anybody have anything else, have anything else well, on we, that topic? We're not even allowed to talk back. I mean, whatever they say, you're going to supposed to be silent and look on the floor. If you look up in the yeah. eyes, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would. I was 
she's not in trouble. You look away. Not... You pretend that yeah. you are not, you know, you got to respect oh, that. Wow. Yeah. No, no, I, I never got that at all. I, I know there's a clear difference, a clear difference, but uh, I, I, I did have my share of whippings when I grew up. Mm -hmm. I, I was a lively child. Lively. So uh, <laughs> I was, I like to have fun and I like to pray, play pranks. So oh. let's see here. Let me look here at uh, this page. Uh, uh, where am I? Way, where where am I? Oh yeah. Hello. We got some new folks. We do. We have one new person. Right. And I was hoping that Lee can do a quick little intro right. for us. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm late, but I, I've been really enjoying the conversation so far. My name is Lee. Um, I was born in Vietnam and uh, I came here when I was three years old to America. Um, and what was the other thing I needed to say? <laughs> I uh, where you're from and what you do. Okay. Um, so I currently reside in New York, in Queens, New York City, and I'm a writer as well. Um, oh. Yeah. And I'm on the last two chapters, I believe, of Amy's book. And I, I, I got to tell you, it's so gripping. It's so incredible. And I feel like I, I'm learning so much about my own like history, you know, like things that I didn't know about the Viet Vietnam War. And it's just such beautiful writing. So thank you so much, Amy, for sending me a copy. And I'm, I'm so enjoying it. Thank you, Lee. I, as you know, I just finished your book and I love it too. It's uh, House of Six. Yes. And House of Six comes out June 1st, which is two, two and a half weeks away, oh. which I'm so excited, your debut. Um, so we've got some amazing talent here. Um, oh. Dee's got a book that's coming out in June. Stacy is like just an incredible editor and author. And um, Sarah's got her memoir, which is about um, surviving the killing fields. Um, um, so, I mean, just, yeah, I'm so excited for all of you all to be here with me tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to chapter 18, unless somebody, somebody may have something else they want to discuss out of that, that uh, chapter 17. If you do, shout out. Um, let's move on to Forgotten Ragdoll. This is one of my favorite chapters. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed was learning about uh, the, uh, the Lunar New Year. And uh, one of the, this is not one of the planned questions, but when it, in the book, it says uh, that it was to welcome good fortune for this zodiac, zodiac sign. So was it mainly for those people that fell under that year's zodiac or did everybody get celebrate good fortune and all? I'm gonna let someone else answer that. How's that? <laughs> well, okay. I don't know. So everybody got to celebrate, but the zo that particular zodiac uh, was celebrated more focally, I guess, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, in my experience, like if it's the year of the snake, then like the anybody who's born under the year of the snake like gets like extra good luck, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but then like if you're born, I mean, because I know that uh, in the Vietnamese zodiac, there are some signs that are like, um, what's the word? They're like more compatible with other signs. <laughs> so if you're born under a more compatible mm -hmm. sign, then you'll get good luck under that like accompanying sign, if that makes sense. It, ride their coattail in on that good luck. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So okay. there's like three years apart, three, six, and you know, like monkey would not go well with yeah. Like, I know my sign would not go well with monkey or snake. And that's my mom and my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and certain thing, you know, it's like I used to be really into those. I kind of just kind of let it go and don't remember. But yes, a lot of superstitious things on those sign thing. And my cousin's still really into it, but she switched from the, the Asian zodiac to an American, you know, like on the other side. And I swear I was trying to get away as far as possible because I think there's just so many things you preempted in your mind. You make a presumptions and then you judge people by just remember, just thinking that 
So this at one point I say that I'm not going to believe and buy in in any of any of those. And I walked away. But that's yeah, and, and, and yeah. they're still now. I mean, I'm dating my husband. And I was like, oh, that's a good sign, you know. <laughs> 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 but that's back then. And it's like even a certain hours, a certain, you know, well, you were born in a certain hours. So I was, I'm a tiger. So I was born at five o'clock. So I'm a hungry tiger. So like, watch out. Oh, because that oh, is a really hunting tiger Wait, 5 hours, like you're not sleeping time so they predict you like to the signs to the hours to the everything they already already give you a stigma or something that you bear that all your life yeah and it's like my brother's a monkey so yeah yeah he's a monkey he's but always he's like destroying things he's always this and the poor <laughs> kids growing up thinking that he's a destroyer yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't buy that. And I never, ever want to impose anybody on those kind of thinking. And, and that's one thing about my culture that I feel like, you know, sometimes people are, I'm not want to say the ignorance, but they just pass down thing and they don't think much and they just buy into those traditional. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and I read Lee's book too. And I think, oh my God, you know, our parents are just like twins in the city. <laughs> and they grow different places, but um, there's so much resemblance. And, um, and I think, you know, not just my family and her family, I think probably it's Amy's family too, and a gazillion million others' families. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a very different generation now. So I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not in that society. Yeah, I hate to say that. <laughs> I hate to say that. I, I love to keep some of the beautiful things but some of the things that is kind of very destructive and, um, and, and is not healthy for the mind. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's why I think, you know, we all grow up kind of screw up because of that, just all messed up. <laughs> I'm curious though, Amy, what, what is your sign? I'm a tiger too, like Lee. Oh, I'm a little tiger. tiger. <laughs> so that means that we don't get along, which is so like, you know, so anathema to like the reality because we're like, I know, so that's why I say don't buy into the it. whole superstition thing but yeah. then again you know it's maybe we get along virtually I don't know <laughs> no. <laughs> don't buy into it Amy, Amy. <laughs> I will buy into it yeah I'm a slave are you <laughs> I'm a are slave you Sarah? Yeah. I am doing things with Sarah every day you a snake yeah. Oh, well, hey, is it in one of the chapters where you skin a snake and 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 eat it? <laughs> uh, I I am so afraid of the snake, even the bad snake. I will not. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. I don't I don't buy into that. Yeah. But but when I was young, it's just like uh, when people was born in a certain year. They expect that person to be to have a certain character. Yeah. So my brother uh -huh. is also a monkey. A so monkey is very smart. Like yeah, super yeah. smart. Uh huh. Yeah, he is smart. <laughs> that was my brother. So I did like, okay, I give you that much. Yeah. I'll take the good one. I don't want to take the bad one. <laughs> uh, but, hey, Amy, are, are you a are you a hunting tiger or a sleeping tiger? <laughs> oh, well, that's a good question because Lee was born at 5 p.m. Is that right, Lee? A.M. A.M. Oh, 5 a.m. Okay, I was born at 11.59 p.m. Oh. You're sleeping tiger. Oh. So, <laughs> Maybe. I guess. I don't know unless a fly lands on my head, right? And then someone slaps it. <laughs> um, don't, don't wake up the tiger. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm lazy most of the time. You are not you lazy. Are, are three books in two years. I hustle. I hus well, my husband knows. I love to sip wine in my onesie all day long. Like that's that's what I do. But you're so productive <laughs> while you're doing it. I know. <laughs> you're the opposite of lazy. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know. I was I was yeah, certain Amy, you were a I see like your updates. I just feel so bad about myself. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> oh my gosh. You gotta get there, girl. You're still young. You uh -oh. got plenty of years. Don't worry. Oh, You'll yeah. get there. I'm whiskey right now. And I'm just like, listen, this is my life. I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm like <laughs> I love it. Whiskey. Woohoo. Okay. Yeah. 
You got a, you got a question. Go hard, go hard or go home. I've got a question for you guys on this Lunar New Year. Uh, one of the sections was really, really interesting to me where you went in there and you described kind of what goes on during that time. Um, eat, play games, watch the dancing dragons, tributes to the elders, firecrackers, no arguing, no cleaning for three days. And I was just thinking about that. You know, you can tell half the time when I'm reading your book, I'm comparing that life to here. But I was just thinking, man, there was a, there's a few things I'd like to grab out of your new year and put it into mine. So uh, can anybody, can anybody uh, uh, kind of shout out any, any of those things? Uh, I've got a few I'll shout out later, but any of those things that you'd like to add to a, uh, an American new year? Money is cool for the Asian New Year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Money envelopes. I left that out. The money envelopes. Sorry, American New, New Year's like nothing. Fireworks. <laughs> American New Year's has fireworks and American New, New Year's <laughs> like nothing, right? Asian we New have, Year's like whoa. We have fireworks. We have fireworks and New Year's resolutions. It's a. It's time to start what, over. What I always. Christmas is yeah. On the other hand. It sounded like that the, the Lunar New Year, in a way, was more like what our Christmas type celebrations yeah. are. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, given the time that this book was set and everything in the communist regime, that your people were probably not allowed to celebrate Christmas outwardly, openly. Mm -hmm. So they take Christmas down, but then Lunar New Year could be big. Well, Christmas what is also my a Christian mm -hmm. pagan holiday, you know, and a lot of a lot of the the country folks were um, Buddhist and Confucius, Confucianism, whatever, um, yeah. you know. So it's it wasn't Christmas wasn't something that we celebrated or they celebrated back then. So um, yeah, yeah. But the doctor says to her, "You're a Catholic." You know, this is how you're so strong you can get through it. So yeah, because that kind of made me want suicide. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think he I think he leverages that for I think he leverages that statement. I don't think he cares so much that she's Catholic. I think he leverages that because he knows what's important to her and he knows she's about to give up. She spilled her guts. And so he knows that her faith is important and he knows that Dolly is. He gets her to dump all those feelings out and then you know and then he's like you know you've got more control over things than what you think and to me that that is like a, a second rebirth in this book had it not been for that doctor she had been I mean I made a list on my notes it's about 20 things that she had been through and now he tells her her daughter may die at them before she's five and she's knocking on the door you know, so to me, I mean, he was just such a hero in this, because at that point, he knew what he was doing. He knew that if he knew that if Snow died, Dolly was going to die. Do Dolly, it's the only chance she had. And so, you know, I just love that doctor. I think uh, he knew that that was something that he could say to her. Most doctors don't care what I mean, He maybe Duck did, but I don't think he cared what her faith was. I think he knew he was trying to shout out anything that snow might hold on to. I don't know. That's how I read it. I what felt the same way, D. I, I, he was one of my favorites. And there's a line here at kind of towards the end of the chapter that was one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. it's the one that says that it's getting more expensive to bribe the right people. Mm. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> well, and, you know, and, and people in Vietnam are just, I think culturally we're just more straightforward, you know, we don't putz around. Right. Um, there's no bedside manner. <laughs> it's just, this is the way it is, it is, you know, and we're very straightforward in that sense. Yeah, but I, I, I uh, that doctor, I just love him so much. He's like by far just the couple, the doctor and his wife, my favorite couple of their characters and it's like that that the compassion even though the Vietnamese they're, they're very straightforward but he, there's just like such compassion and kindness mm -hmm. exuding from him and 
And I, I love Dee's interpretation of like, you know, in that moment, he felt like she needed to hear that, you know? Mm -hmm. So he just yeah. was like, you're a Catholic, you know? Like if this is your faith then follow it, like believe that this is going to pull you mm -hmm. through these hard times. And, and she, she right. really like took that in. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, helped, it helped her hang on, you know, exactly. he helped her. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up as a Buddhist, you know, and I'm a refugee and I came here when I was three years old and we did like sweatshop labor mm. and yeah. you know, we didn't know like if our next meal was guaranteed, you know, we were so emaciated, so thin and it was really our faith, you know, we just, it doesn't even matter what the religion religion is. I mean, like that's, that's my own interpretation, but just having something to hold on to when you're struggling and just believing that, you know what, we're going to get through this no matter what, because there's a higher power. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, for right. so long, you know, that's what she was holding on to. And she was, she was just like going through those motions, you know? I love I that. agree. Because I he, totally he was, agree. Very, very powerful. Yeah, he he was one of my favorite characters too, which I didn't think he was going to turn out to be one of my favorite characters because Mrs. Tran and Sister Six were my favorite characters, right? Other than Snow, of course. But, um, <clears throat> you know, he was multifaceted. And I love the fact that he, he and his wife portrayed um, something other than the typical stereotypical, right? They were mm -hmm. affectionate with mm -hmm. one another and they risked yes. everything to help other people. They weren't the selfish ones. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Right. So anyways, that, oh, but, God, you know, one of, I love their relationship. One of their, mm -hmm. go, ahead, go ahead, Lee. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, I just love the relationship that they were so warm and affectionate towards each other, which is like in Vietnamese culture, it's so rare. I mean, in my own family, I never saw an ounce of affection between my parents. So to see that they were like openly affectionate towards one another was like, oh my God, yes. Like, you know, like they, they defied like the tradition. But there's a right. lot of affectionate in Vietnamese community more than Chinese community. Yeah. Um, I, obviously, uh, they, there's there's a certain things, but in Vietnamese, they're more affectionate than the Chinese because you know my parents are also Chinese. If they don't snap on each other or fight, that is called good a good day. Don't even expect <laughs> yeah. anything more That's than a that. Good day. <laughs> That's a good day. Just take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> wow. You, I had another thought with the. Along, because like I said, I just really fell in love with uh, the doctor. Uh, and um, again, I'm making parallels here, but you know, the way that he uh, took such danger and such risk, put he and his wife, uh, every time he helped somebody, it just wasn't that he helped somebody, he helped a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And to me, I was thinking that reminds me, I mean, this may be a stretch for some of you people, but I just thought of, uh, What's her name? Harriet Tubman, uh, who helped the slaves yeah. with the Underground Railroad. Uh -huh. You know, he, yeah. she smuggled people through the, to safe houses and stuff. And I thought, you know, um, that's what he did. You yeah. know, it, it put himself second to save other people, just like she did. So um, anyway, I just could listen to you guys talk the whole time and, and tell us what it's like, yeah. but, but um, I love it. I love it. You know, there, uh, let me, let me move. You know, when I was, when I was just like one years old, um, my parents tried to escape by boat as well. And, you know, we met somebody who was very similar to this doctor that you wrote about. That's why like, he's so near and dear to my heart because he helped us, he tried at least to help us escape by boat. It didn't work out because, so my parents put me and my three older brothers and we were super young, so little. We, they put us into this like straw basket and pretended that we were like goods, you know, that they were like selling on this boat. Um, and eventually my somebody found us, somebody like, and my parents were like, they threw their bodies over this, this basket and this officer came and was like, you need to open this up. And so my parents opened it up and 
they they found us, but this officer covered it back up and he said, come with me. And he, he by a stroke of like, good luck, he was like, I'm not going to charge you. I'm not going to take you to jail, but you, you can't do this, mm. you know? And you so- You meant to come by plane. You didn't mean to come <laughs> Exactly. But he was like, you, 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 you know, I, I could have you arrested. I could have you killed right now, but I'm not going to. And why did he do that? Because he was friends with a person who took us, who, who arranged this whole thing. Wow. And so, yeah. And so, it, and that person was very similar to this doctor who like did this whole, you know, he was like constantly helping people get by on these boats. So wow. I like, we're so grateful to these people who like saved our lives. Right. Ugh. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's, let's move on to chapter 19. <clears throat> Fish and snake. Ugh. Fish and snake. This, th this one, I think after that last chapter, this is, uh, I had, I laughed during this chapter and that last, you know, the last chapter, uh, not so much laughing, <laughs> but to me, this chapter, Fish and Snake, uh, kind of goes a little bit, Lee, you know, there's that, that thing where, you know, uh, people really aren't who you think they are, maybe, uh, kind of thing. The, to me, the takeaway was that Sister Six really didn't like, uh, uh, True and True's family, particularly, I'll probably mispronounce his name. It uh, looks like Locke, but it's probably not supposed to be pronounced that way. L O C. Locke. Uh, the son. Locke. Yeah, Locke. <laughs> Locke. Locke. Uh -huh. And uh, oh, so, uh, so um, anyway, you know, uh, this neighbor who's pretty dirty and, and not so uh, not so well kept smells the cooking of this fish and, and all this stuff that the, the women are cleaning and cooking fish that Tree had found after this typhoon, all these fish just sloshed up on a field. So he went and gathered them up and found a snake and it was gonna be a big feast for, the, for their family, one of the first times they had meat in a really long time. Well, this little kind of little scant little fellow walks up and he said, I, you know, he said, uh, I smell, uh, the cooking and uh, I didn't really pick up on that in the beginning but uh, I'll just ask the the question you know uh, if, I hope I uh, word it right but you know uh, somebody uninvited that comes over to your house and smells you cooking and uh, to me he was fishing whenever uh, he was fishing for an invitation because he complimented the smell and oh, this smells so good. And oh my goodness, what is it? And all that. And um, so at that point, you know, of course, who was it? It was uh, sister, sister Six's husband, was it Amy? Who invites him and, every, yeah. and his wife gets mad and everybody gets mad because you know, are you serious? This is the first meat we've eaten and who knows how long and we're gonna feed three more mouths here. And uh, he, uh, he basically is like, you know, um, we're, it's honorable, we're supposed to help our neighbors, thus and such. So does that, does that kind of feed, uh, how do you guys uh, see that feeding in to, uh, we've talked before, sometimes you think your neighbors are your friends and sometimes they're not. And who do you trust and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, so that you, do you trust your neighbors? Do you not trust your neighbors? They trusted him and it backfired on them, you know? I think, I mean, for me, what, what was difficult was that like, I could understand their point of view as well. You know, like I, I think Amy does such a great job, like crafting these really complex characters where like you want to be upset with them, but then you realize like their circumstances where they're like, they don't have any food either. And like, if this can get them like on the good side of the government, right? Mm -hmm. Where like the government yeah. might spare them and give them like more rations than like from a perspective of survival, like they have no choice, you know, it, it's hard that where there's just like, okay, like, do we report this family or do we like, you know protect them and like if reporting mm -hmm. them will 
like protect us, you know, then it's, it's such a hard choice, right? So for me, like my heart both went, I was both angry at them, but then I like understood their perspective as well. Right, 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 right. Uh, and I kind of, I mean, I, you're in a pickle yeah. because you, you, you fall the police, but you know, uh, any, at any minute, somebody you trust could stab you in the back because yeah. they're, they're dying off. I mean, they're not surviving too, they're struggling. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to do what they can do, but. Right. Um, I mean, so, it, it, it reminds me of like, you know, during the Holocaust where like, you know, these Jewish families, like their, their neighbors were like reporting them like, oh, this, this neighbor is Jewish, you know, reporting them to the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard, you know, and mm -hmm. it, right. the question, like, what would you do in those circumstances? You know, if you were somebody who right. was, was not Jewish or was not, you know, on like the bad side of the government and not being persecuted, right? You, right? Yeah. A lot of time, those um, incentive are more about you know if you give me something, I won't. That's just more more or less using for blackmail because mm -hmm. they are in dire. They need food. They need stuff. So yeah. uh, reporting to the government is actually a lot of time is not not a whole lot of glory for them. Um, they don't get any thing out of it except you know maybe the the government would you know give you a good point or something yeah, but more or less it's just using it to like if you have anything you better give it to me or else i'm gonna report you mm -hmm. that's the incentive right. gotcha one one oh, little cute yeah. thing that, that i kind of missed uh, did somebody have something or is that my delay uh Kathy? i'm sorry for uh speaking up but uh, yeah it was the uh, same impression that I got that when he came, he said he could smell the issue Like you said, he was inviting himself, but it was interesting do they trust him? And <laughs> that, yeah, when you don't have enough to feed, your family but yet work to be nice to other people and somebody comes up knocks on the door oh i smell this i it smells good uh and i come in yeah well taking a risk mm -hmm. letting that person come in because you don't know that even though he's your neighbor but what kind of a neighbor yeah. Is he a good neighbor or a bad neighbor? You don't know. Yeah. So you have a very, very risk, a highly risk of, it could have been worse. Well, that makes me think of um, the, the Clever Phoenix chapter when we talked about good versus, or love versus hate, right? And I think Stacy was the, one, the moderator for that one, um, where we talked about, you know, how do you, um, how do you know what's going to win over the other, you know, because mm -hmm. love is so powerful. Um, but is it really what's going to conquer and bring peace? Um, yeah. And it boils down to, well, do you love your neighbor or are you going to be selfish and just look out for yourself? It's that dichotomy, you know? Well, what's really wonderful yeah. is that like, even though this was like their first time having this feast, they still accepted this neighbor, you know, <laughs> again, they're the entire family, you know. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just so, so heartbreaking all around, like on, on both ends, right? Yeah. You realize like, oh, it, it takes so much for somebody to, to betray another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you that. really have to be at like, such a low point to do that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, and, and go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's seven o'clock. <laughs> so we, we came on our hour. It is. Um, yep. So here's the thing. You, if you got to go, then I totally understand. If you want to stay, we can continue going. Um, I do have some photos that I wanted to share also before we leave, but um, I'll leave it all up to you whether you want to go ahead and, and leave or stay for a little bit longer. Okay. Okay.
Uh, yeah, I have to go in just a I, few minutes, but I would yeah. love to see these photos. Okay, <laughs> me too. So let, me, let me go ahead and show you the photos. Um, I try to show a little bit of um, pictures at these uh, book studies. Okay, so I wanted to show you this one. Um, so on the upper left is actually my uh, uncle seven and his wife, aunt seven. So brother seven, sister seven. Um, and we talked about how they're not affectionate people, right? We're not affectionate people, but my trip back in 2008, this was the most beautiful thing to see him wrap his arms around her oh. and to want to wear my Seattle <laughs> sweatshirt because yeah. even though it was like freaking 85, 90 degrees, they were, they were cold in Vietnam. Um, and, and after you go and stay in Vietnam for a while, you get acclimated to the, to the area. And so 75, 80 degrees becomes cold anyway. So he wanted to borrow the sweater. Um, lower left is tree, my cousin with his family, his, his oh. father, his mother reunited and also his wife, Kelly. Um, so that was a beautiful thing. We went on a, on a trip together. Um, in uh, Vinh Thao, I think it was, um, or Vung Thao. No, it was some, Vung Thao. Oh, sorry, it wasn't Vung Thao. But anyway, so the middle picture is just me, just amazed at how big those um, jackfruits are on a side street vendor um, market. And then uh, top right is, I hope you can see that, um, is actually my mom seeing brother uh, six reunited with brother six and that was the last time she got to see him actually because he passed uh, a few years after that um but they were just in tears seeing each other after all those years and then down below tree my mom me and sister six um together on a bridge and then next one um top left is actually brother seven and brother six and a neighbor we were all getting together to drink tea and just hang out uh, in front of Brother Seven's house. Down below is us um, getting together, drinking beer and uh, what we call nyowing, nyow. Uh, it's just getting together to eat and drink all day long. And I am I was invited to the table, which is pretty darn cool because A, I was female and B, I was the youngest. Um, but to be invited, that was pretty cool. And next to me was my cousin Tree. And we were actually at, in this particular photo, we were talking about um, tattoos um, because Tree and I both have tattoos and we ended up displaying our tattoos. Um, middle picture, that's Tree and me, again, just drinking. And it got so hot that he took off his shirt. <laughs> um, upper right-hand corner, last session, we talked about cemeteries and crypts. Um, there is a picture of my mom visiting her parents um, in the backyard where we have um, their burial. And then down below is also what we talked about last time is uh, all the, the grave sites and the crypts um, that are in Vietnam that you see while you're driving through the country. And then the last picture I wanted to show you, um, it's just kind of a, a street market scene in Vietnam. Upper left is uh, a woman selling, you know, fabrics. Um, and this was at the Benton market in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon. And then you see all the fruits and vegetables and uh, all the scooters and motorcycles there. So that's just kind of a typical market scene in Vietnam. And then of course, um, this is something I'm excited about. It's D. Britt's uh, debut novel that's coming out in June. And uh, the Fireside, it's a series, you guys. This is the first of the series, Fireside, the James Johnson story, which is about assisted living home uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And there's all these characters in the, in there that are just amazing. So anyways, that's what I wanted to show you before we uh, move on. Congratulations, <laughs> Dee. Yeah, I got so many Thank you. From that. I like, I, I, you know, as I was reading this, I wasn't sure how much of it was like based in reality and based in real life, but just seeing these photos and seeing these characters come to life. Oh my God. <laughs> like I'm about to start crying right now. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, 75, 80% of the, the novel is true, honey. And it's all based on my, my family. And, 
Um, yeah. So, and you'll see in book two and book three, even though they're fiction, um, yeah. you do see pictures of my family and the characters that I write about. Um, hopefully I don't get sued, <laughs> but, um, yeah, anyway. Wait, I mean, you don't say anything terrible. <laughs> like it's no, all, not, like nothing to get sued over, of course, but yeah. Yeah. And I, and anyway, Oh, well, thank you so much. For great me. job. Thank you. Uh, for great job, Amy. Yeah. yeah. Do we have any? I got to go to. Okay. See everyone. Lee and Lee, thank you so much for coming. Sarah, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Um, Love and, you. And we'll see you next Sunday, hopefully. Yes. Um, yeah. Awesome. I guess yeah. I picked up to yeah, do. Yeah, part of these. <laughs> What's that? No, I say I definitely want to be a part of these conversations, you know, moving forward. I'm, oh, I'm that would be so great. I miss them. <laughs> so we fun. have, well, we have only June left and then we're done. So okay. I think three or four more left. Yeah. So, um, and for those who want to stay, we can hang on and, and capture the last couple of questions and then we'll we'll end the recording. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kathy, Kathy, I think I interrupted you. Are you about to say something? Kathy? Uh, oh, what I wanted to say that you're a very amazing person, and I am so glad that I've had the chance to meet you. And the book is awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm truly blessed to that you joined. That Stacy um, brought you onto our little discussion here, and um, I I hope to meet you one day. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's, this is the beauty of, of virtual meetings. We get to meet all of us from everywhere. So thank you. Well, to Stacy, maybe I can get with her and we have coffers on more together. That would be great. Well, good right. night, everyone. Thank Love you. you. Good, night. Bye. Bye. good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right, D, take it away. Okay. You want to finish? Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did, I, did, I kind of got the, the tail before the nose of the horse. One of the things I thought was so, so important, and it was humorous, but was the frying pan in the britches but when you're going to get a, a spanking. And I just thought, oh, my Lord. That and one of the things, you know, I think I think it shows a lot of things. I think it shows when she was a little little girl, it already showed her will to survive, to be have ingenuity, to figure it out. She didn't want to get a whipping, and so she thought nobody would notice. And another thing that I think is it it did for me uh, again was just I think every family has a kid that would probably do that. It really helps you relate to her as somebody, you know, it's like, oh, well, Johnny did that last week, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So uh, I was curious as to what other people thought about that scene, because it, it is one of my favorite scenes. Anybody uh, want to? Yeah, I have uh, a story to tell you on that. Uh, <laughs> I've got, I had uh, three boys. And I really don't know exactly what what happened for them to get to, uh, for me to get after them. I don't know what the deal was, but I told them all to go in your room, and I'll be in there. <laughs> so I go just before I get into the room. I'm at the door, and I hear all this laughing. Well, first I went in, let me back up a minute. I went in and of course I, I had to punish them. So I whipped them. Well, I walked out the door. I told them they had to stay in the room and I walked out the door and got halfway down the hallway. And I thought, well, what are they laughing about? So I go back to the door and I'm listening, and they're just laughing away. And I opened the door, and I said, what? Each one of them 
took a book and put it in their pants. <laughs> so they, they knew that that didn't hurt them any because they had, uh, when I read that about putting that frying pan in the pants, I thought of my boys when they put them books in their <laughs> pants. And I started, la I la laughed so hard, I was crying. <laughs> so that that was well, just so funny. It struck me of what my boys did. Oh my and gosh. from then on, uh, they told me, I didn't do it, Mama. I said, no, but you all got a whipping, didn't you? <laughs> and you're not going to do it again, are you? Uh, no. And like I said, I don't remember what they'd done, but I... That just struck me back then. Uh, they was probably about five or six years old when they done that. But how many five, six year olds think of putting paint, uh, books in their pants? And I just thought that was funny, Amy. That's oh, clever. That's really clever. And I wonder what books they were. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember, but they <laughs> must have been good books. Because they were, they were laughing about it. Uh, that's great. So, uh, another can, are you want, are we done? I was going to say, really quick confession that story was actually about me. Um, I was about to get a whooping from my mom, and I stuck a frying pan down my pants, and it was the last time that she ever hit me because she laughed so hard um, and thought it was just super clever that she she was like, okay. And you, actually you'll read that in book two, Snow in Seattle. Um, but that was actually me that I put in there. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Wonderful. One little, one little thing to back up that, you know, that, uh, you know, the frying pan in the pants. And then the fact that with their lunar uh celebration money uh that she would bet on the fish uh fish fights with the boys and uh, uh snow usually won uh, uh did a lot of winning and i think it was sister six that that bet but did not win and we just i think we see little seeds as we go that tell us of what of what snow is capable of and you know, seeds, seeds that are nurtured to grow. And I, I see little pieces like uh, her willing to step out and, and go do that bedding uh, uh, along with the pants thing and everything. It shows as, as the book progresses, you can just kind of see, I think those, those occurrences when she was younger helped her do what she had to do later in the book. And I, I just thought that was like, I told you before we really got started I think it's very, very smart the way that you just didn't all just blow, you know, put it all out there in one big blum with with nothing to really see a little thread that's tied all the way through. And uh, I think it's crafty the way that you left some stuff out and didn't really just say this is the deal. Anyway, um, yeah. I didn't really ask the question, which I guess I just said it. But, uh, <laughs> A little insight, uh, I guess, into into Snow's character or how she grows up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was so good. Um, and one of the things you mentioned that I, at least let's get this one in, and then if people are ready to leave, or we've got, I've got more, but we can do others. You mentioned something about the I don't know if the way I worded it was the family hierarchy, signs of the of hierarchy of the family, and. Uh, that is, you see a lot of that whenever they're at the table and Sister Six is not really cool with the whole fact that these people are here. And then she talks about how she cleans the, it's the snake, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The snake. And uh, you know how when the, the two family came over and the, uh, all the family came in to greet them and two patted everybody on the head. And there were several things in there uh, that talked about family, uh, the pecking order of family uh, relationships, how how it how it all pans out. Um, I was just curious if anybody uh, in reading that 
uh, any of it hit you uh, particularly. To me, I don't know why, but the patting on the head, it was like um, recognition, but it's also telling you that you're beneath me, you know. Um, anything else you guys uh, was, was uh, a, a spot on any of that uh, kind of the family pecking order? No. Well, you see that in the um, um, in the first chapter too, actually, with the wedding, the way the tea is served, you know, um, yeah, you know, the, the head of the household, the father, gets served the tea first, mm -hmm. and then it just goes down from there in terms of the pecking order, like you said. Um, right. I, I will say that in the Asian culture, the the head is a very um, um, revered, I guess, um, part of the body. And so it is not appropriate, it is very disrespectful to touch um, oh. someone's head. Um, unless you're super, super intimate and close to that person. Um, but you would never see traditionally um, a child touching their grandfather's head you know, because that's, that's seen as very disrespectful. But again, it, it shows you how close a family can be if they're <laughs> able to cross that boundary and touch each other's face and head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I didn't, I have no idea. That's big. That's a big thing. Yeah. Um, and just at, 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 as that whole thing progressed, um, really uh, how, uh, Locke, you know, uh, everybody kind of had him pegged as somebody who was uh, a derelict. And as it turned out, that's what basically, uh, not maliciously, but he just blabbed everywhere. And, and uh, that's what brought the cadres or mm -hmm. the, the cater. Yeah. yeah. So I would just like to ask uh, out of the, because uh, I'll tell you, when I started reviewing these, I, I don't really remember chapters as a grouping, I just remember events and scenes. And when I got into it, I was like, well, boy, didn't I get, I, I, these are some of my favorites. I would like to hear from you guys if there was anything that we talked about, not anything that you really have insight into that we did not talk about today. Something that you, you're like, man, we didn't hit on this and it's gotta be said. That's a good question. Uh, would you all think about, I think it was chapter 20, the, was it Fury? Um, yes, Fury is 20. When, um, yeah, I might be getting ahead of myself, but is that the chapter where the father was struck and, um, he starts to go a little bit of, you know, he's going senile and he's losing his memory yes. and he's not wearing his pants yeah. and, um, I kind of want to, was curious to know what your reaction was. Did you think it was a result of him getting thrown to the ground by one of the communist soldiers? Or do you think that was a natural progression of, of getting older as, you know, an elderly? Um, mm. What was your kind of gut reaction or initial, you know, thoughts about on that? I thought maybe and it might have been from one of the, uh, what do you call them, the Candace? The caters, uh, the, the soldiers was thrown to the ground. Yes, that where the father was thrown to the ground, and it he could have had a skull fracture, mm -hmm. and that could have done some damage, and he don't remember. Yeah. And that's the impression that I got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, this isn't right there at the, at the part where he got thrown to the ground and Snow went to check on him and then HAI hit, hit the police guy. But one of the things I really, uh, so this is kind of separate from that, but along the lines of father falling and stuff, I thought it was really uh, artful the way that you... Uh, early on, you said, you know, he, his, his joints ache all the time. He has headaches, uh, all these ailments earlier. I don't know what chapter 
and that kind of planted the seed and I was and a uh, frequent colds, always cold. And so I was thinking, man, did he get like an autoimmune disease? Maybe he got bit by a tick and he got an autoimmune disease or something. And then later he becomes senile and sometimes certain diseases can progress into senility, even if you don't have the, you know, with or without the age. Yeah. But the way you laid that out, I, I felt like his, uh, his age and his senility made it easy for him to go to the ground, but that it was a, a pretty, uh, you know, pretty bad deal when that police guy knocked him down. So. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like you don't know, right? It could be, it could be residual Agent Orange. It could be just old age. It could be the communists coming in and throwing him to the ground. It could be all of those factors, you know. And it's mm-hmm. like there's so many anomalies and there's so un, so many unknowns. Um, and in a country like Vietnam, when you have, you know, hundreds of years of war and all that stuff you just don't know things come up and and it's easy to make to blame or to come to your own um right yeah conclusions on what what it could be so i kind of left I that had not, open i didn't even think about agent orange i mean that is a, a, a it would do all that there, yeah, yeah. It could do all of it. Who yeah. knows, right? wow. malnutrition yeah you just it's all that right wow so deep, very deep. Yeah, <laughs> this is the first time we went Thanks. over. So, so thank you so much for moderating. And uh, Kathy, DJ, Stacy, thank you for hanging out for an extra thirty minutes. Um, I, I just, I'm gonna be sad when this is all over, but I, I really appreciate you supporting me, and I love that we are able to record this so that, you know, at any given time we can go back and just kind of uh, reminisce, I guess. So great, great moderating, D. And this was like 24 hour notice. She was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, okay. Anna unfortunately had a family emergency, so she couldn't moderate today. And I and thank you, D, for stepping up to the plate. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. It was fun. It's always fun. So yes, yes always. Great. Well, until next Sunday, ladies, thank you. Bye. Yeah. Great discussion. Bye. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.